I'll get started. Good to know. Okay, one second. I'll get that out of our way. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so I'm Katie. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm excited to talk to everyone today. Uh, today, I'm going to do a presentation on some, some of the powerful Purdue women um, that we have documented in the Purdue Archives and Special Collections. So to start off, I'm just going to give kind of a quick introduction to the Purdue Archives and Special Collections. So at the Purdue Archives, we collect, preserve, and make available for research um, rare materials and original materials that document um, four main collecting areas. So we collect records that document the university history. So this includes like records that document faculty and staff, students, alumni, um, and the administration. We have a psychoactive substances research collection that documents the history of psychoactive substance research, which is really unique. Um, we have, uh, we collect records on flight and space exploration, um, since Purdue does have such a strong program. So we collect records of people who are affiliated with um, that area. And then my section is women's history. So we also collect records that document kind of the underrepresented, historically underrepresented experiences of women um, at Purdue and in Indi Indiana's past as well. So as I mentioned, I'm, or as I mentioned, I'm the Brands A. Cordova Archivist, so I manage the Susan Bulkley Butler Women's Archives at Purdue. Um, and so our purpose is really to preserve original materials that document women's history here at Purdue University. So we collect records of faculty, staff, and students, really similar to the university history mandate as well. Uh, we collect records of women's organizations and programs at Purdue University, and also local organizations, local women's organizations as well. So this was a very challenging, <laughs> very exciting, but very challenging uh, presentation to make because there is actually so much history um, of women at Purdue University. So the Women's Archives was established in 2006 after we recognized that there was a need to actively collect records documenting women since in previous years, many of our collections uh, did not represent women and largely represented men at the university and women tended to be underrepresented in those materials. So since 2006, we have we now have over well 237 collections documenting women's history at Purdue. We've highlighted uh, 141 on our website through creating biographies, uh, and there's 146 years of women's history at Purdue. Um, so women were admitted to the university in 1875. So we have a lot of history. So what I decided to do was to break it down into categories. So I broke, I chose four categories that I wanted to highlight uh, and chose 14 women in total um, that fall into each of these categories. So we have first, the women who made inroads for other women, leaders, and their in, so people who've had impacts not only on campus, but throughout the United States and around the world. Activists, the so women have, who have actively fought for change, either at Purdue or within their communities. And then also trail, trailblazers at the university, so people who have really moved Purdue forward. So um, and for these, I tried to make sure to represent not only faculty and staff who tend to be at the university for a lot longer, but students and their contributions as well. So to get us started, I'm going to focus on the, well, the first category, of course. Oops. Uh oh. One second. There we go. So our first category is first, of course. So women who have really made inroads for women and some of those much earlier women at the university. So the first woman I'd like to talk about is Sarah Oren Haynes. Um, so she was born in Ohio and went to Antioch College. 
um, where she was educated before coming to Indianapolis to teach. She was the first female state librarian for the Indiana legislature in 1873. Um, and then in 1875, President Shortridge hired her as the first female faculty member at Purdue University. Um, so if you, well, as you'll remember, 1875 was the first year that Purdue had women students as well. So that same year, um, they hired a female faculty member. And oddly enough, her title was female teacher of the university. That was very quickly changed because President Shortridge found that extremely awkward, which I'm not surprised, <laughs> um, to assistant professor of mathematics. And later she, uh, her title was, well, she was appointed a professor in botany at the university. Sorry, do you want questions as we go? Uh, at the, is it okay if we do that? Yeah. I don't have a lot of content yeah. to go through. <laughs> um, so Lauren, uh, when she came to Purdue University, she had a daughter, um, Kata, that she lived with. And uh, when they were at the university, they actually lived in the boarding house uh, at Purdue which later became Ladies Hall. So one of her roles while at Purdue was actually to supervise the women students who stayed at the boarding house as well. Um, in her first year, she developed uh, and proposed a plan for the, an experimental orchard on campus. Um, the Board of Trustees approved this in October of 1875. Um, and as you'll know, that's about two months <coughs> after the school year starts. Uh, and this was approved and they, they laid out a plot about, I think, a one acre plot northeast of Purdue Hall. Um, and that's where this experimental orchard, orchard was. In addition, she helped develop the early rules of conduct for students at the university alongside Harvey Wiley. And let me make sure I get the name right. <clears throat> um, some of these rules are, of conduct included uh, so prohibitions against carrying guns to the classroom, smoking, profanity, and my absolute favorite, uh, spitting on the floor. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. She also sponsored the first women's literary society uh, on campus, and this is actually the first women's organization for students. Uh, at the time and for a while after that, and that was the Philadelphian Society, and that was in 1877. And in 1876, she was also appointed the Associate Principal of the Academy, which was basically a preparatory school at Purdue to prepare them, prepare students to enter the College of Science, which is the formal university at the time. She retired in 1878 after she was remarried uh, and left the university. The next women I'd like to talk about are you, Laura Miller and Roy Jeanette Webb, uh, who are two early students at Purdue University. So you, Laura Miller, uh, which is right here, that's her, was the, one of the first female students at the university and our first female graduate as well. She graduated in 1878 with a Bachelor of Science. And Roy Jeanette Webb, right over here, uh, sorry, on the right, <laughs> for those who can't see me pointing. Um, is the first recorded African-American woman student at the university, and that was in 1909. So Miller was uh, a founding member and the first president of the Purdue Philalethean Society, and that was in 1877. Um, and as I mentioned, in 1878, she earned her Bachelor of Science, and that's what you're seeing up on the screen right now. So we have that in the Purdue archives as well, so her original diploma. Um, she was the first professional librarian of the university, um, and she earned that position in 1878, so the same year that she graduated from Purdue. Previously, the university library had been managed by faculty advisors or students. Uh, she was also one of 20 students accepted into Melville Dewey's uh, library training program, which was the first professional program for librarians in the U United States and potentially in the world. I need to double check that though. Um, later in her life, so after that, uh, she enrolled in at Columbia University. Um, she, event she published four plays and eventually became a metal worker in California. And let me make sure I get this right as well, just double checking my notes. 
Um, she was actually involved in designing the first Church of Christ in Berkeley, which is actually a National Historic Landmark today. So, Roy Jeanette Webb, our other early Purdue student, um, was in, she was enrolled in the School of Pharmacy around 1909. Uh, we don't actually know her exact start date um, because this yeah, this uh, newspaper clipping that you see up here is the first mention that we have of her at the university uh, and one of very few um, records that we have of her. Uh, so Roy Jeanette uh, was, was in the class of the 1911 uh, class of the School of Pharmacy. And while she was at Purdue, she was treasurer, treasurer and one of the founding members of the W.E.B. Du Bois Club, uh, which was a club to kind of support and uplift uh, Black students at the university at the time. Um, and if you can read the article here, there were only 10 Black students at Purdue at the time. She did not graduate from Purdue. She left before graduating. But she did go on um, to earn a nursing degree from Provident uh, Hospital's nursing school in 1914 and subsequently worked uh, in Chicago as a nurse. She later went to Evanston, uh, where she was head nurse of the Dr. Uh, Dr. Butler and Dr. Garner Sanitarium. Um, and then in 1916, she actually became matron for girls at the Lincoln Institute, which was a historically black college in Missouri, in Jefferson, Jefferson City, I believe. Um, that same year, she was actually called on um, to accompany the 8th, 8th Militia in Illinois, um, which was an all-Black militia, and they were slated to go down to the U.S.-Mexico border. It's unclear whether she actually ended up going there, um, but she was one of few nurses who were called on to go down with them. Um, and then in 1916, she actually resigned from the main, her position at the Lincoln Institute, uh, citing lack of support as the reason, and she returned to Chicago to work as, to continue her work as a nurse. Okay, the last woman of our firsts um, is, that I'd like to talk about today is Emma Montgomery McRae. So she was a teacher and principal in Indiana. She worked in Vevey, which I apologize, Hoosiers, if I got that pronunciation wrong, <laughs> and uh, Muncie, Indiana. She was hired in 1877 or 1887 um, by Purdue as a professor, professor of English literature and a lady principal. So as far as we know, she's the first one person with that title. Um, and so she's the first unofficial Dean of Women of the university. So she was responsible for um, providing not just, or providing support to the women students at the university. Um, while she was at Purdue, she founded the Purdue Girls Club uh, to further Purdue girls spirit and unite the you know, few women students at the time at the university. So to bring them together and create kind of a sense of community on campus. Um, because of her support of women students and women student organizations on, the camp on campus at the time, uh, the students affectionately referred to her as Mother McRae. And you'll see that all throughout the degree yearbook. Um, before McRae came, or in addition to all the firsts that she held at Purdue, um, she was pretty significant in Indiana as well. So she was actually, um, the first woman elected as president of the Indiana State Teachers Association. Um, and she published and spoke frequently on education, teaching, and specifically the education of uh, women students. So this publication that you see on the screen uh, concerning the education of girls was written by McRae. Well, and I think it was published by Purdue. And in it, She argues that women and girls should receive a more robust education to better manage their homes and equip themselves to not only find employment as boarders or teachers, but in fields such as architecture, house decoration, applying the sciences, or and applying the sciences to industry, pharmacy, and sanitary sciences. 
In addition, um, and this is something that we found out really recently, um, she argued in front of the US House of Representatives in 1880, so before she came to Purdue, um, arguing for Hoosier women, women's rights and desire to vote as well. As you know, they didn't. Anyway, <laughs> it took a few years uh, for them to gain that right, but um, she retired from Purdue in 1913, um, so after about 26 years of service at Purdue. So the next section I'd like to talk about are some leaders at the university. So women who have had significant impacts on the university, but also outside of Purdue. So first up is Captain Dorothy C. Stratton. Dorothy Stratton was hired at Purdue in 1933 as the first full-time Dean of Women. Um, at the time when she started, there were less than 500 women students, but during her tenure, uh, that increased to over 1,400 women students for her to provide support for. She was also a professor of psychology at Purdue as well. Um, and while she was there, she oversaw the creation of a liberal science program for women um, and created an employment center, placement center for women students as well once they graduated uh, from the university. She established a house mother's training school for fraternity and sorority mothers as well um, that supported um, house mothers throughout the United States, and that was held at Purdue. In 1942, she took a leave of absence to serve in World War II, where she was actually um, the first woman to be commissioned as an officer in the U.S. Coast Guard. She also set up, she created uh, and directed the Women's Coast Guard Reserve, um, which is titled SPAR, or the acronym is SPAR, so Semper, let me double check. I don't want to say it wrong. Semper Paratus, always ready. In 1944, uh, she was actually, she became a uh, captain. And then in 1946, she retired from the military and was awarded the uh, Legion, Legion of Merit Medal for her contributions to women in the armed forces. After her retirement from the military, she served as the executive director of Girl Scouts of America until 1960. She lived to 107 years old, or 107 years old. Um, and then, so she passed away in 2006. And then in 2012, the third national security putter was actually named for Stratton. So the UC, USC GC Stratton, um, which was sponsored and commissioned by uh, then First Lady Michelle Obama. And so that's the program, the program from the commission that you see on the screen there. So our next leader is Dr. Lillian Gilbreth, um, who I wonder if some of you have heard about. Um, she was hired at Purdue University in 1935 as a professor of management. Um, and she actually was the first woman in the United States to become an engineering professor at, a, at the university level. Um, when she was hired, she was appointed professor of management and also given part-time duties in home economics. She was hired at around the same time as Amelia Earhart um, through an initiative by the university to encourage um, future opportunities for women. While at Purdue, she worked in the motion study labs, improving them, and as a lecturer. So I think she was at Purdue for only about five or six weeks out of the year. So she lived in the women's residence halls. Um, and we have heard from some students that they had, you know, lunch or dinner or something with her, which must have been an amazing experience. <laughs> um, so she traveled internationally and consulted and with industries and presented on motion study. And so before Purdue, she had really established herself in the engineering field. Uh, so her and her husband, Frank, co-ran an engineering consulting firm um, where they focused on applying motion study techniques to industry. So sports, factories, um, workers with disabilities, that sort of thing. Um, and they used both. So she had a PhD in psychology and he had a background in engineering. And they used a combination of those two skills to apply to their consulting work. 
Um, unfortunately, Frank passed away in 1924, so very early, uh, and they had a business and 12 children. So Lillian Gilbreth kept running the business and raised and supported their 12 children, putting them all through uh, university as well. Um, but their business had to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, there was sexism in the industry, and um, so she had to kind of pivot and focus more on home economics, housekeeping, and things that were more considered women's spheres and women's domains. So she worked for companies such as Macy's, Johnson & Johnson, uh, Girl Scouts as well. And she's actually, so she actually also um, is credited and did redesign the kitchen um, to kind of what we, and you'll recognize a lot of the things from her redesign and what we use today. So the circular work, uh, workspace is something that Lillian Gilbert's designed. So she reconfigured the kitchen. Um, pedals on trash cans is Lillian Gilbert invention. You know, shelves in the, your refrigerator doors. The light switch on the wall are all things that she um, redesigned in the kitchen using these efficiency principles that her and Frank used for their consulting business. And so this pamphlet on the screen right here is from her, um, was called the Kitchen Practical, and that's from the, her first design kitchen in 1929. In addition, to, she also served on presidential committees for civil defense, war production, women's employment, and rehabil the rehabilitation of people with disabilities. She retired from Purdue in 1948 um, and is commonly referred to as the mother of modern management. And her and Frank's work is still widely researched, studied, and actively studied and written about um, around the world. Okay, the last person in this section that I'd like to talk about is Darlene Clark Hine. Um, so Clark was actually, or Hine was actually uh, hired at Purdue University in 1974 as a professor of history. Uh, and during her time here, so she was here until 1987, she was also a uh, vice provost. Lost at the sound. You can't hear us? This is Leslie, I can hear you. Oh, okay, all right, good. <laughs> I can hear um, you again, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so she was professor of history, uh, hired as a professor of history at Purdue in 1974. Um, and this was a really uh, integral time at the university. Um, so she was one of the first professors who ended up teaching in the newly established Africana Studies program. That program was established because students at the university in around 1968 protested uh, against the racism at the university and in, ad in addition to many other things, uh, we're calling on the university to teach African American experiences and history at Purdue. And so in, I think it was 1975, uh, or actually I think 1978 was when they first started offering classes uh, and she was an interim director in that program as well at Purdue and one of the first teachers. Um, at the time, uh, she was the only tenured black woman in the state of Indiana. When she was here, so during her time at Purdue, um, she worked with the, just getting the exact title so that I get it right. Um, she worked with the National Council of Negro Women, the Indianapolis section. Um, to write a history of Black women in Indiana. So that organization pulled together the resources that they wanted a historian to actually write the book about this history. Um, and so that's what this is right here on the screen. So that's, um, that was published in 1981. Um, and it was really crucial, or she states that it was really crucial to the direction that her research took after that. Um, so she was at Purdue until 1987. During that time, she also created the Black Women in the Middle West pro in the Middle West project uh, in collaboration with the same group. Um, they earned grants and worked with local communities to collect records of Black women throughout the Midwest. Um, 
and make sure that those were preserved to preserve the history of Black women. And I think it focused on mostly Indiana and Illinois. Um, she left Purdue in 1987, went on to work at Michigan State and Northwestern. Um, she's published you know, over five books on Black women's history and really helped establish that as a field, subfield within the field of history. Okay. So the next section I'd like to talk about are um, women activists, so women who have fought for equity and creating more equitable places equitable places both at Purdue and in their communities. So the first woman I'd like to talk about is Captain Holland Schleeman. Um, and you'll see a lot of similarities between her career trajectory and Dorothy Stratton as well. They're quite close. Um, so Holland was hired as a director for the Residence Halls for Women in 1934 and directed the House Mothers Program here at Purdue, which was established by Dorothy Stratton um, through the Dean of Women's Office. She, similarly to Stratton, she served in the Women's Coast Guard Reserve uh, in the SPARS program. So she took a leave of absence from Purdue during World War II to serve and also attained the rank of captain. Um, in 1947, she returned to Purdue as Dean of Women, and she served in that role until 1968. During her time, she made a lot of significant changes. So Helen Schliemann was instrumental in ending women's hours at the university, so women had a curfew um, and needed to obtain permission to be out past a certain time or to go anywhere on the weekend or go anywhere overnight. Um, so in 1966, women's hours were ended for all women except for freshmen, and then by 1969, the curfew was lifted for everyone. Um, she also established this SPAN plan at Purdue University, which is still in operation today. It was a program to provide um, scholarships um, and career opportunity support for non-traditional women students, so women who were older or and mostly had children as well while they were trying to go through school. She also was involved in many women's organizations throughout the state of Indiana. Um, she was involved in the Hoosiers for the Equal Rights Amendment, um, National Organization for Women, and the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women, um, which is established by President Kennedy and looked at creating, looked at as locating the barriers to women um, and creating remedies to, you know, ensure that they have basic equal rights. She also advocated for a woman president at Purdue in the 80s, which sadly didn't happen, but that's what this article here is about. Um, when, the, when Purdue advertised um, nominations for, pres or for pre new presidents of the university, they asked everyone to nominate him Helen Schleeman rightly was quite offended by that uh, and submitted a list of 10 nominees across the United States. Um, unfortunately, none of them were selected, but um, yeah, I think it just really personifies her, who she was. She was also involved in a lawsuit against Purdue and the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association over women's pensions. So women had to contribute the same amount as men to, the, to their pensions, but were paid 15% less because on average, they lived longer. Uh, <laughs> luckily, they won, that, <laughs> they won that lawsuit, which is really, I guess, heartening in a sense. Um, and then in 1990, uh, a new student services building, building was uh, built at Purdue, and it was named Schleeman Hall in her honor. There's also a help, the um, Schleeman Award, which uh, recognizes contributions of faculty uh, and administrators to um, moving women forward and providing supports for women students and women's issues at Purdue. I'm not sure if you've heard these names in the news lately, but I really wanted to highlight them as well. So these are the Parker sisters. So Frida Parker Jefferson and Winifred White. Um, they were raised in Indianapolis um, by their parents and attended uh, a segregated high school. Their parents were really strong advocates for pursuing higher education. 
And so both of them actually uh, enrolled at Purdue at the same time. They were only 10 months apart. So they both enrolled at Purdue in 1946. Uh, Frida was enrolled in home economics and Winifred was enrolled in uh, the science program here. When they came to Purdue, uh, the campus was uh, segregated. So black men could live in the international house if there was space available, um, but most black students had to live in segregated Lafayette, so across the river. Um, and this, you know, meant that they had to commute into campus every day. They couldn't participate in the same activities as the rest of the students either. Um, and I think in Black Purdue, which is a video by the Black Alumni Association, I think they mentioned having to walk in a few times as well, which is a long, a long way. And this was actually at a time when freshman women were required to live in residence for their first year. Um, so they applied to residence uh, when they first got here and were denied. Um, they, along with their parents, petitioned the university to review this decision and were denied again. Um, however, they worked with the Black community and gained the support of Go then Governor Ralph Gates, um, who pressured the university to integrate housing. And so um, during their time at Purdue, they were permitted to, or that changed, um, and they were some of the first Black students to live in the residence halls um, on the, at the university. Uh, so they both lived in Bunker, Hall, Bunker Hill. Yes, Bunker Hill. And uh, Winifred also served as, I think, secretary on the governing board for the women's residence halls as well. And so this photo right here on the screen is from the Bunker Hill residence. And you'll see them just in the second row right there. And as you have probably heard in 2020, 2021, um, so very recently, the Board of Trustees approved the renaming of the Griffin Residence Halls uh, in honor of the Parker sisters. So there's going to be uh, Frida Parker Hall and Winifred Parker Hall as well. And they're right beside their the residences nearby the Black Cultural Center. And Renee Thomas, the director of the BCC, was really integral in that decision or in that proposal and turn, bring that about. So the next one I'd like to talk about is Helen Doss Williams. So she was hired at Purdue in 1968 as a professor of French and a counselor for minority students. Um, so she, her, part of her role was to um, recruit students from schools throughout Indiana, to recruit minority students from school with, throughout Indiana and bring them to Purdue University and then to provide um, mentoring and counseling support for them while they were here as well. Um, part of the, her role was also to make sure they kind of had access to what they needed. So financial support, she kind of connected them to those, those elements. She was actually the first African-American faculty member at Purdue um, and was really integral in creating the African, Africana Studies Program, the Black Cultural Center, and she actually wrote the grant proposal that established the Learning Center, which is now the Academic Success Center. Um, she also served on the first board of the Black Caucus of Faculty and Staff and served as advisors to Black student organizations as well. There are also um, reports of her having students over to make sure that they you know, had enough food so she'd feed them um, and would really try to connect them to financial resources to make sure that they could succeed at Purdue. In addition to all her equity work on campus, um, she was actually heavily involved in the civil rights movement as well before she, got, she, before she came to Purdue. Um, so she was an educator, a public health worker, and a civil rights activist in the South. Um, so in, oh no, I'm gonna forget the year. <laughs> One second. Um, so, she taught at uh, Benedict College in South Carolina, which is a historically black college. Um, and at that time, she got heavily involved with the Highlander Folk School, which was a social justice center. 
um, and she would help recruit students from Benedict College to the Highlander Folk School uh, to participate in voter registration workshops and to learn about grassroots political organizing and processes. Um, so the Highlander Folk School, she was actually there at a time, um, so she was a board member, but she was also there at the time when Septima Clark and Rosa Parks were there as well. Um, in 1964, she moved to Mississippi to teach at Tougaloo College, which is another historically black college. Um, she taught French, um, but in addition to her work at Tougaloo, she helped establish some of the first Head Start programs in rural Mississippi, which supported the education and welfare of um, low income and minority children. Um, so she was integral in obtaining the grant funds um, from the federal government to create those schools. She helped, um, and she also helped train the teachers who would teach at the Head Start schools in Mississippi as well. And so that's what you see over here, that's the newspaper clipping. So it's talking, this is from her time in Mississippi, um, establishing those Head Start programs. She also directed, um, directed the Head Start schools as well. In addition to that, she <laughs> participated in protests in Mississippi and also helped Black Mississippians register to vote. So she would actually drive them to polling stations, even though polling stations were moved sometimes multiple times a day to help get them to register and to vote on Mississippi. Oh, and in 1993, um, the Black Cultural Center established the Helen Bass Williams Scholarship uh, to help support um, minority students at the university. And this was in honor of her life and all of her work um, supporting Black students. So our last category is trailblazers. So women who have moved us forward at Purdue and really paved the way for other, for women after, after them. So the first woman I'd like to talk about is May Jewel Gong Simmons. She was born in Miami, Florida, um, and her family uh, had immigrated there from China in 1916. Um, in 1951, she enrolled at Purdue uh, in a degree in microbiology, and when she graduated in 1955, she earned a Fulbright Fellowship to study in Germany. While she was there, she was really inspired um, to pursue a degree in medicine, which is something that she hadn't considered um, before. Uh, when she got back, she enrolled at the University of Miami, earning uh, her MD in 1962. Uh, she became a medical doctor and worked in pediatrics and radiology. While she was at Purdue, um, during her time here, um, when she first got here as a freshman, she went through Rush, uh, which is, you know, how. I had to be taught this, but <laughs> I'm from Canada. <laughs> um, she went through a rush. Um, she wanted to join a sorority, um, but was initially denied entry. So at the time, um, sororities were, or their bylaws stated that they were for um, white women. So she was excluded because of her background. Um, however, uh, so at the time she, when she started as a freshman, she uh, was in Wood, Wood Residence Hall. Um, so that's where she lived until her junior year when actually um, Delta Gamma had gone to their national organization and had their bylaws changed so that she could enroll in the sorority. So by her junior year, she, along with the freshman, freshman going through Rush, she was able to join Delta Gamma. Um, she was also a really skilled clarinet player. So I think she'd been playing since she was 13 years old. Uh, and when she got to Purdue, she wanted to join the military band because it had the most advanced instrumental. Uh, it was the most advanced instrumental group on campus. Um, so she went to Spots Emmerich, who was the conductor at the time, and was told that the band was just for men because it was, a, it was an ROTC military band at the time. Um, however, luckily, she was very insistent uh, and asked that he at least hear her play. Uh, which she did and was immediately admitted uh, to the band. So she played quite a complex piece uh, and was instructed to go get a uniform. And so she was the only woman on the Purdue military band throughout her entire time actually at Purdue. Um, but by the 1960s, um, more women had actually 
tried out and were admitted to the Purdue Military Band at instrumental positions as well. So um, the next person I'd like to talk about is Cassandra A.G. Chandler. Um, she's from Gary, Indiana, uh, and she was actually initially planning to uh, go to university out of state, but was recruited by Cornell Bell um, through the Business Opportunities Program, which really tried to diversify the uh, Cranach School of Management at the time, so tried to diversify that program. Um, so she came to Purdue um, and went through a Bachelor of Science in Accounting. Uh, while she was here, she was a really active student, so she participated in, let me make sure I also get this right, the Alpha Lambda Delta Honor Society. She also sang in the Black Voices uh, of Inspiration Choir and was part of the Purdue PALS program, which provided support and guidance to incoming minority students as well. She also served as a counselor for the Business uh, Opportunity Program of which she was a graduate, um, and went on to hold positions at Procter, Procter & Gamble, Texas A&M, and Exxon. And she ended up founding her own company, uh, Systematic Design Consultants, which is an IT consulting firm. While she was here, um, in her sophomore year, she tried out and won, um, or became um, homecoming queen in 1978. So she was the first African-American homecoming queen at Purdue, and this was uh, a really a very big deal to a lot of black students, faculty, and staff on campus. So she actually got letters from the Black Student Union. Um, this letter here is actually from uh, the students in one of the Africana Studies program classes who all uh, sent her a letter. So this is signed by Darlene Clark Hine, who you'll recognize. Um, and then on the back of this letter, which I don't have here, all the students signed their names as well. Um, she even had a letter from uh, somebody she didn't know, but a person in Gary, Indiana, telling her how important it was to see an institution like Purdue elect a black homecoming queen at the time. Um, so she, it was very influential and inspirational to a lot of people. In addition to that, while she was at Purdue, she served as the president for uh, president and one of the founding members of Purdue Historic Society of Minority Managers. Uh, which supported students going through the management program in Craner, in Craner, yeah. And the last person I'd like to talk about today is Dr. France Cordova. Um, she earned her PhD in physics from Caltech in 1979, uh, though she originally was going through, uh, was interested in the arts after the Apollo 11 mission, uh, she was inspired to pursue aeronautics uh, and physics. After graduation, she worked at the Los Alamos National uh, Lab as a professor in astronomy and astrophysics, and was later hired as the chief scientist of NASA, where she worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. In 2007, she became Purdue's 11th president, the first and currently only woman president and the first president of Latin American descent. Um, while she was here, she established the College of Health and Human Sciences, the Global Policy Research Institute, uh, and advocated for improvements to the Rec Center, um, which did, she was successful in, and in 2013, when those were completed, the Rec Center was named in her honor as well. Um, and then in 2014, she was appointed head of the National Science Foundation position, in which she served till 2020. Um, and she credits Amelia Earhart and Neil Armstrong as inspiring her to go into astrophysics, uh, who are both, as you know, well, Neil Armstrong is a Purdue alum and Amelia Earhart worked at Purdue in the 30s, um, which I thought was just a beautiful connection. Um, and so that is a selection of, you know, you know really strong, I mean, you know, amazing women uh, in Purdue's history and in Indiana history. Um, as I mentioned, we have over 140 uh, women highlighted, uh, on, and you can actually read their biographies on our website. So if you see in the bottom right corner there, 
the gold box um, on our website. You can click that and read biographies and see photos of over 140 women in our history um, that have just, you know, all made varying impacts of their own. Um, and if you're interested in more information uh, or collections that are held at the Women's Archives, you can read about them on our website. Um, we have rare books, we have archival collections, oral histories with women um, for you to learn kind of more about the variety of experiences that women have had at the university. I just want to give credit um, the women's art or the research for a lot of these women. Um, so learning about their accomplishments, their history, their experiences has been done over well over a decade. Um, the Women's Archives was originally, it was established by uh, Sammy Morris and Stephanie Schmidt, who really did a lot of the digging and finding names and finding little bits and pieces and following those to find out more about these women. Um, Adriana Harmeyer, so Roy Jeanette Webb, we only found out about her, you know, within the last two years. Um, and it was just through that newspaper clipping that you saw uh, up on the screen. Um, so she really did a lot of work in pulling together those pieces and finding out as much as we know about origin at well. And then also local researchers, you know, and advocates kind of help pull together all this information. I just want to credit uh, all the images that you saw are from the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections, with the exception of Sarah Orrin Haynes. Uh, that photograph was provided by one of her descendants. And then I just want to promote our upcoming exhibit. <laughs> um, so it's opening August 23rd. Um, it's uh, called Not Given But Earned, Women's Fight for the Vote, and it's about the women's suffrage movement. Uh, you can learn about who's your women who are involved in the movement, Purdue women who are involved and have an impact on the movement, and see kind of a variety of rare books and archival materials that document that history. So we have political cartoons drawn by John McCutcheon, who's a Purdue alumni and illustrator for the Chicago Tribune. We have letters from Mae Wright Sewell, um, who is an internationally recognized, you know, women's rights advocate. Um, and then we have, you know, early women voter manuals and a lot of, it's a lot of neat stuff. So. So that's everything that I have. <laughs> I don't have I tried to pare down. Yeah. Uh, you had to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can, probably in this room, we can think of at least, you know, another three dozen names. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was, it was nice, Katie. Uh, so we have time for questions. I think we've got, uh, we had some questions, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, back to the first woman, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Oren Hayes. So you said, I forget what her actual degree was, or you didn't say what her degree was in, but you said like what she was hired no. to do, and then she did like botany and math, and mm -hmm. what was her actual degree to, I mean, I know that qualifications were a little more fluid back then, but. So the only thing we know, she attended Antioch College in Ohio. Okay. And she served, so she worked as a teacher in Indianapolis, um, presumably like public school teacher. So I think that was her, those were her qualifications at the time. Um, so it was really early days as well. So, you know, it was the first year that the university in here, like um, Purdue opened. So she went to, that's all, that's kind of what we know. Okay. Yeah, she just had a lot of like professor of math and then botany. I'm, this is an assumption, but I'm assuming that based on her experience and what she taught through like during her time in high school or potentially some of the courses that she took um, at college probably were enough at that time uh, to teach students. She didn't last very long at Purdue, right? No, she was only there till 1878. Um, and then I've read mixed mixed things. Um, so she got remarried in 1878, and it was very common for women to not be allowed to work once they were married or very um, frowned upon. There is also um, presidents of the university changed at that time. And I think it was President White was after Shortridge, right. and I don't think he had as uh, accommodating or positive views towards women. Well, so. I wonder because 
she was recruited by Shortbridge, who lasted a very short period of yeah. time and was, was pretty unpopular with the faculty. Um, so I wonder if that played a role because White had a very different style as far as how he managed the university and the restrictions that he put on mm -hmm. um, the university, although he did continue to hire women faculty. He did, uh, yes, but I am not sure. I guess it depends on what capacity because it does seem like she made a lot of she contributed a lot in those early days. And so anyway, that was a part of Robert Topping's work where it said that that there that is possibly could be one of the reasons why she decided to leave. But it doesn't look like she went back into higher education. She lived in, I think it was Peru afterward, Peru, Indiana. Um, afterwards with her husband who only lived a few years. He died pretty quickly and then she moved up to Michigan with her daughter. Um, I believe her daughter left with husbands. No, no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but as far as I know, she she didn't pursue higher education after that. Any questions? Leslie, do we have any uh, questions in the chat room or anything uh, folks online? Uh, I don't see any in the chat nope. window. Good job, Katie. Okay. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> Was a, certainly a lot of topics uh, with yeah. as, uh, women at Purdue. Uh, we could have you back for probably a good week uh, yeah. to actually <laughs> talk about these things, the stories that go with that. Um, and like some of these women you could talk for an hour about, you know, like as particularly Lillian Gilbris and Helen Bass Williams. Or we know a lot more about them than some of the other ones. So. Gilbreth is the uh, super red dozen lady, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, well, in fact, we had a presentation here about uh, three weeks ago about another uh, leader, and that was, of course, Elizabeth Shoemaker, who was the first oh, yeah. master's degree uh, recipient with that. And uh, so again, a lot, a lot of firsts from that, from that standpoint at Purdue. But it was kind of interesting that during that time, as much as we were a small agricultural centric university at the time, that actually weren't too bad <laughs> yeah in the early years for sure yeah so it, it's kind of a, kind of an interesting time and yeah. that's uh that's probably one of the better pictures of ladies hall that I've, I've seen for a while from that that uh that was that was an interesting place all in and of itself so <laughs> are there any other questions for katie all right i'll go to the end in case anyone wants their website good i know is it true Watch that the person that invented stovetop stuffing was a woman um, yes. at Purdue. Yeah, Ruth Sims. I celebrate her everything. I'm going to celebrate her what tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I want to do a little bit more digging on this, but uh, Gertrude Sunderland was the faculty member who kind of oversaw, I believe, Ruth Sims. But also, you know, master mixes were another bit popular thing at the time. And so I'm really interested in finding out more about like what other things came out of, you know, the home ec field right. that are so integral to what we do, you know, the pre-made foods that we use today. All right. Well, any other questions? Not. We'll call to a close. Uh, again, we do have uh, other talks will be coming up next month. We do have uh, Nick Schenkel, who will be here talking about the history of West Lafayette. We do have Angie Klink, who will be in talking about her books. We'll try to get her back every year, talk about a topic related to uh, that. And some other interesting things, so check the TCHA website. You will receive, if you're a member, you will receive a little postcard of mine that you won't have for the program. For I did did you? All right. It's so, already marked. All right. <laughs> Very good. So lots of things going on here at TCHA, and uh, we hope to see you at our next program. Thank you for coming, Kate. Thank you.